wanted to, uh, to thank all of you for, for being here, and uh, we, are, we have decided to go through the book of Revelation. This is something that, that people have asked for for many years, but it takes time because the book of Revelation is the end of the book. You know, I don't know how many of you guys like to skip to the end of a book and just read at the end to see what happens. You're like, I can't wait that long. I'm just going to skip to the end. Uh, some of you guys are uh, big spoiler alert people, you know, you watch movies and you're like, oh, in the Star Wars, do you know what happens? And then they go ahead and tell you, you know, the ending without you letting, letting you follow through the whole story. What about any time you skip the context of a joke? You know, you didn't understand the beginning of a joke and, and you kind of come in at the end and just hear the punchline and you're like, well, that's not funny, you know, because you didn't understand the context. You didn't understand what was going on before that. Well, the same is true of the book of Revelation. It's the end of a story that began nearly 4,000 years before this, this even began, uh, before Revelation was even written back in the book of Revelation. You know, of the 404 verses in the book of Revelation, 278 at least, at least uh, I have on mine 348, so I guess it just depends on who's saying it's, it's referring to something in the Old Testament, but approximately 70% of all verses in the book of Revelation are referencing the Old Testament. So if you have not read the Old Testament, if you have not read the context, if you have not read the beginning of the story, then the end of the story is not going to make as much sense. That's an encouragement that as we're going to be studying this over the next several weeks, months, we'll see uh, how long it takes us, but I want you guys, I need you guys to be reading the book of Revelation. Uh, when, when we were at uh, Bible school, our assignment, one of our assignments was to read the book of Revelation once a week for 12 or 13 weeks, however long we were there. That was our assignment, one of the assignments. Just read it. You know, if you've never read it, or it's been a while, but as we're going through this, you need to read it. And it will help you to have a better understanding of, of the book here. And so, again, a lot of references go back to Isaiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, Zechariah. And for those of you that have not read the whole Bible, there's going to be some challenges that, that you won't get some of the references back to Babylon or, or some of those kinds of things that, that, that go on there. So I don't know about you guys, but anytime that you had to write a paper, who, what, when, where, why, how, you know, it's like, okay, you got to answer those questions. And that's, that's my model for you guys this morning is, is we're just going to go through the book of Revelation and say who. Who wrote the book of Revelation? Well, Jonathan just got through reading. It says it's the revelation of Jesus Christ. So Jesus is the one who's revealing it. So it's his revelation, but he's writing through John. And so he's going to be writing in verse 4, chapter 1 and verse 4, it says, John to the seven churches who are in Asia. So who wrote it? John. And you guys can get into all of the different scholars and, and who wrote, which John is this, but there's a lot of evidence that points that this is the Apostle John, the one who wrote the Gospel of John, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. It's the same, it's the same John. We're talking about the same John. You know, those of you in that, from the res are like, which John are we talking about here? And so, um, he, this is, uh, so, so what we have is the, the Apostle John because you will hear a lot of the same types of writing where he'll use the words G referring to Jesus as light or the word. And, you know, there's similarities that, that you will pick up. But nevertheless, he's writing to the seven churches of Asia. And there were more churches in Asia, but, but these are the ones that he was writing to. And you've got to keep that in mind as you're reading. You're saying, now, who is it being written to? Is it written to non-Christians? Is it written to Christians? How, how, how do we pay attention to this? This is important as we're trying to understand 
the book of Revelation. When was it written? Again, there's debate on it, but there's a lot of evidence that shows that it was written probably around 96 AD by the Apostle John. So he's the oldest apostle, and, uh, and it's getting towards the end of the first century, about 96 AD. Where was it written? Uh, the Apostle John, he says here that he was on the island of Patmos. And uh, if, you, if you go down to verse 9, go down to chapter 1 and verse 9, it says, I, John, your brother and fellow partaker in the tribulation and fellow partaker in the kingdom and perseverance, which are in Jesus, I was on the island called Patmos because of the word of God and the testimony of Jesus. So where is this at, this island of Patmos? Um, this is modern day Turkey. So over here is modern day Turkey, but back in the Bible time, it would be considered Asia. Uh, they call this Asia, and that's where you're going to have the, the seven churches of Ephesus and Smyrna um, and Thyatira, and all of those churches are in that area. But anyway, over here on this island, there was a prison, and so this prison was on the island of Patmos. That's where John is at. He's most likely in jail on this island, and God has given him a vision. And uh, he's supposed to write these visions down and send it to the seven churches of Asia. So that's, that's, the, that's the where. Where is this, where is this uh, being written from and to those seven churches. Those seven churches um, is, is important because when once we get there in chapter 2 and 3, you'll see that each of those churches have some good things and some bad things. There's, I think there's only two churches that no bad thing is mentioned about them. Uh, but those churches... It's interesting how we, we will have similarities. You know, sometimes we might be more like the church at Philadelphia. Sometimes we might be like, more like the church at Ephesus. Sometimes, so, so we as a congregation, as we study these churches, we'll see some of their good things and some of the bad things. And, and we, we, can, we can learn from that. And uh, so, yes, the letter was written to them. And that's how we have to understand it. Then we take those lessons and we try to apply it to ourselves. For instance, Ephesus. Jesus says, you have lost your first love. You know, could that happen to us as a church? That, that when we first became a Christian, man, I was on fire and I just want to serve God and I want to be there and I want to get rid of these sins in my life and not just live in them anymore. I want to make those changes. And then you sort of get cold, you know, you drift away. And, and uh, Jesus says to the church at Ephesus, he says, you've lost your first love. You see, and that, that could happen to us. And, and so what is Jesus, how has he addressed that, right? So those are some of the things that, that we want to learn uh, about, right? Why? Why is he writing this? Why is the book of Revelation there? Well, first and foremost, it's a finishing of the story. You know, this goes from Genesis all the way to Revelation. And can you imagine a book that took 1,500 years to write? You know, 1,500 years, different people from different languages. Some were rich, some were poor. They lived at different generations. They lived in different cultures. Some were kings, some were sheep herders. And, and yet there's a common theme. There's a thread. There's a story that's, that's woven through, and it all comes to a summary in Revelation. You see, it's all, it all comes to a head. It all finishes up in a beautiful story at the end of Revelation. God is also providing hope and encouragement, because one of the things that you'll see is the Christians at that time they were experiencing persecution. Now, I'm not 
say, not talking about being made fun of. You know, guys at work are like, oh, you're like one of those Christian type people, huh? You know, not that kind of persecution. That's not, these guys were losing jobs. These guys couldn't get food at the market. These guys were getting arrested. These guys were getting beaten for following Christ. That can be discouraging. You know, I mean, all of us get discouraged here. And I don't know if any of you have ever been beaten up for your faith. I don't know if any of you have ever been thrown in jail for your faith. If we get discouraged, not even facing that, imagine those people who are facing that kind of opposition, that kind of persecution. Do you think you might feel left out by God, that you might be forgotten by God. Those are challenges. And so the book of Revelation is there to, to really encourage them, to provide hope, to, to hopefully help them know that, yes, they are going through hard times, but there are going to be harder times. If you look at history, they were facing persecution, but they're going to face even worse persecution coming up. If you guys read history, they said that they would uh, put Christians on a pole and light them on fire to, to, to light up the, the night, kind of like a candle, like a street light. They wanted uh, they, to make sure that they had light at night, but they would use Christians. They would throw them to, into the Colosseum, let lions and tigers rip them apart while they were alive. They, would, they, would, uh, they, they enjoyed seeing the Christians being killed and trying to kill them off ultimately. These Christians were about to face it. They, they were getting ready to face some real challenges. So how is God preparing them? He's giving them this book. He's giving them a vision of saying, yes, physically all these bad things are happening to you, but let me pull back the curtains. Let me let you see what's happening spiritually so that you can trust me. I'm God, and I am the victor. I'm the one who has overcome. Just read the book of Revelation, and you'll see, you know, people, people will talk about the, the, uh, the COVID in Bible class brought up Armageddon, you know, people make a big deal about Armageddon. Well, if you read it, it's like all these forces of evil and all is coming against God, and then next verse, it's over. You mean all, the, all these powers and all this darkness and all these forces that, that you're thinking there's going to be this big battle. God is, God is a creator. I mean, it's, it's, it's like, it's one of those, some of you guys on video games, if you're leveled up to the highest level and you play an intro level person, it's like you wipe them out with no problem. And it's like that wasn't even a competition. You know, it's, it's, it's like on some of these movies, uh, Thanos and, and stuff like that in Avengers, that if they have this much power and they go up a, against a normal human being, it's like nothing. Imagine God going up against anything that's created. He created it. What kind of power do they have against God? He's the creator. And so you've got this big battle building, 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 and then it's over. You know, that's how we have to understand who we serve. It feels like we're the little ones and the devil and darkness is so powerful and we feel crushed and overwhelmed. But in reality, we are on God's side. We are with the Lord Jesus Christ who has overcome all of darkness, all of death, all of the powers and oppressions. He has overcome. We just have to trust Him. The appearance of things isn't always what it really is. That's what Revelation does. He's revealing. He's showing us. Let me show you what really happens. Let me show you how this ends. The devil and all of his angels are thrown into the abyss, into a huge darkness of dungeons and suffering and hellfire. Let me show you how it ends. Whose team are you going to be on? Whose team are you going to be on? 
because it appears that the devil is winning day in and day out when I'm sitting here suffering and I see people dying and I see people being thrown in jail. It just doesn't seem like we're making any progress. The book of Revelation is to help them overcome that. So as we look here then, what, what type of writing is this? We read in, in chapter 1 that it's a letter. It is a letter written to the seven churches, but it also says that it's a prophecy. So there's going to be some things that are going to happen. There's some things that are going to happen in the future. Now, some of them will happen quickly to help them, encourage them to say, hey, there's some things going to happen quickly. Just hang in there. But there's some other things that's going to happen at the end of the age, the end of time. There's still some of those prophecies that are yet to be fulfilled. So they needed the prophecies of you're going to get deliverance. You're going to be delivered. But then it also gives us prophecies of, hey, there's some things yet to come that the end of the day is, is, is going to happen. And then the other thing, what is what type of writing? This is apocalyptic literature. And for those of you that were here for Bible class, there'll be a review, but apocalyptic writings were very popular between 200 B.C. and 100 A.D. And even a little bit before that with the book of Daniel and Ezekiel, those have apocalyptic writings as well. But it became very popular. It was a popular form of writing. And what it does is it uses a lot of symbols, figures of speech. That's apocalyptic writing. And, and for us, it doesn't make sense because we weren't raised around it. But we were raised around figures of speech. You know, if, if, if somebody says, you know, I'm freezing to death in here. Literally, are you freezing to death? Or is that a figure of speech, right? And, and so we use, these, um, we use these figures of speech that, that people get all the time. I just used one, all the time, right? Is it literally every single time that we talk, we use figures of speech? No. And you really don't notice this until like when I went to Africa and I was having to, to preach and teach and they translate. Well, when we're using figures of speech to explain stuff, they don't know what you're talking about. So you have to use plain, regular English, right? And, and that's, that's tough, especially if you're from, from the res, you know, you're, well, it's sort of like when you're over here, you know, you start painting pictures. You paint pictures of, of what is it about? Right? You, and that's how we talk. We, we, when we're not familiar with something, especially if you're talking to a little kid, you know, you're, you're trying to, they're like, well, what is that? And you're like, well, it's kind of like, and, and so you're making a comparison of something they're familiar with to something they're not familiar with. Well, God is saying, you guys are humans, and you're not familiar with this spiritual world over here. So I'm going to paint some pictures like with beasts and colors and, and, and paint some pictures for you of what you're familiar with to help you understand of an area that you're not familiar with. You see, that's how God is, God is teaching us. And he works that way to help us in our faith and in our understanding. So we look here also, what is this ultimately about you know, what is the book of Revelation ultimately about? It, it is a symbolic vision to bring hope, but also to challenge those churches to stay faithful even during persecution. You know, God isn't, God isn't just asking us to roll over, you know, and just, just say, poor you, and, and this whole Christian thing is just terrible, and, you know, He's challenging us. He's saying that, that you are to be a soldier. You are to be a part of his army. But this army is going to look different. It's going to act different. But it's an encouragement to encourage is to put courage in you, right? I'm lacking courage. So you encourage. It builds up, right? To give you the, the, the strength, the energy 
to look at Jesus as the great overcomer by suffering and giving his life. This army is different. I, I, I know I told this in Bible class, but guys, this is, this is such a huge part where there's a scroll, a symbol of a, of a wrapped up scroll, and there's these seven seals on it, and, and it says that everybody was crying in heaven, and they're like, nobody is worthy. Nobody's worthy to open up this scroll, and this scroll is really going to help us understand and see what it's all about. And then John says he heard the Lion of Judah. And so you imagine a powerful lion. You know, I love, I love watching uh, National Geographic and those things when, when um, I was watching one the other day and it said this female lion was sitting there and a whole bunch of wildebeest were running by, running by, and this lion was just waiting for the right time. Next thing you know, this male lion just comes in and just tackles and, and kills this, this wildebeest just like that. And I'm like, man, that's power, right? So you think about Jesus as the Lion of Judah. A lot of kings, they would have the, the lions to represent power and king of the jungle type of thing. He says he heard the Lion of Judah, but he looked and he saw a lamb. And he says as if slain, throat cut, blood all over it. And you're thinking, it's just a little lamb. How is that power? How is that a, an overcomer? How is that a victor? That's the new kingdom. That's the new power. You see, that's the secret of this scroll is that throughout time, from the days of Genesis, Cain and Abel, very first brothers, one was jealous of the other and killed him through power, through aggression. And that's the same story repeated, 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 repeated. And so we as humans are really trained from, from a very young age. Power wins. Who's the strongest? Who's the fastest? Who's the richest? Who's the smartest? That's the one that wins. And then we see this lamb that's humble, that was self-sacrificing. And it seems so upside down to us. How can that be the victory? How can that be the overcomer? How can that be the power? Because Jesus proved it. And so for us to be the followers of Jesus, he's going to say, that's the model. How are we going to defeat this current world today? How are we going to overcome the division that's going on today? How are we going to overcome the, the, the hatred and the division? How are we going to overcome all that seems like is just overwhelming? How? How? Through the model of the Lamb, that you and I are willing to give up our lives to sacrifice for others. That it's not what I want, but it's what God wants. And I'm willing to sacrifice for them to show them love, to show them kindness, because that's one of the things you'll see in Revelation is there's sevens, the, these seven trumpets and seven bowls and and each time it's like there's judgment. God is bringing his justice and his wrath. And, and, and so you're, you're, you're like, well, that will get their attention. That will cause them to repent. Guess what? They don't. They don't repent. They get even more mad at God. Like, why are you punishing me, God, even though they've been rebellious against God and doing all kinds of evil? They don't repent. What causes the repentance? What causes the ultimate change? The sacrifice of the lamb. It was when they saw the love of God. It changed them from the inside. It wasn't fear that ultimately changed them. It was love. It's a complete 
story. That's how the whole story ends, is with Jesus Christ and what he did on the cross. That's why it's the apex. That's why it's the summit. That's why it's the climax of the whole story is Jesus at the cross. That's what the whole Bible is about. And this new army is supposed to follow in those footsteps. We are his sheep, ready to be slaughtered. And think about it. Even to become a part of his people, what does he say? You must die to your sins. To, to just be initiated into this kingdom. He says, you've got to trust me in what I did. You've got to trust and follow me through that. You've got to be willing to repent of your old ways, your old way of thinking, turn away from that, be buried in baptism. Well, what does that represent? You are dying. You're dying. To be a part of this, you are dying to your old self. And it says you're resurrected to a new life. Just to become a Christian, that's the very first thing. And then the rest of our lives, we're supposed to take up our cross daily. It's about sacrifice. Every day, it's about not trying to one-up the next person. It's about trying to help the other person up. You see, but usually by me pushing them up, I'm the one getting stepped on. But he said, that's going to change the kingdom. That's what the kingdom is all about. And you've got to trust Jesus. This revealing is showing you what's going on behind the scenes. That's where the real victory is at. But it's so hard because of the way that we're raised, the way that we go about it. This letter is to build confidence that God will keep his promise to punish these nations. Those nations that rebel and persecute his people. I think that's what's difficult, right? Is when, when, when we get taken advantage of, when we see others being taken advantage of, and we're like, this is, it's not fair. It's not fair. And it makes us angry. It makes us angry when things are not fair. Well, if you see Christians being persecuted over and over for their faith and their trust in Jesus, and you're like, this government is so corrupt. Seems like the government is so corrupt and, and they just keep going against us for our faith. It's unfair. So God has written the book of Revelation to say, no, 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 no. They're not getting away with it. They will not get away with it. The punishment is coming. You just have to hold on. Let me do it my way. Let me do it my way. Their punishment is coming. And so that's why this letter was written. It's to help build confidence that God will judge. That's what you read about in the end. It says the devil and his angels and all of those who want that type of lifestyle. They don't want anything to do with God. God, I don't want anything to do with you. Then he says those people will get their they get their wish. You don't want to be with God? Okay, he has a place that, that, that you can go to be there. That's, that's what this is about. So what does it do? It ties all of these pieces of the gospel story. It weaves the past to show that God always has and God always will be with his people. What does Jesus, when he was born, they said his name shall be? Emmanuel, which means what? God with us. When you look back to the Genesis story and Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He was betrayed by his master's wife. He was thrown into jail and he was forgotten by the people that he helped over and over throughout the, the, that story of Joseph over and over it says, and God was with him. Do you know what the book of Revelation is? People suffering that it feels like God is not with us. But the promise is God is with us. 
God is with us. And so that's what we're trying to look at. Revelation confirms that Jesus has won the victory. He's won the battle. He's won the war. And it forces you to decide whose team are you going to be on? Who's your master? Who is your master? Because it shows based on who you obey. If every lust and every desire that I have is what I obey, then that's your master. If you're obeying what Jesus tells you, then he's your master. It shows in who you obey. That, that, that's what really comes through is who you, who you are obeying. So I hope that this has given you a little bit of an overview of the book of Revelation. I didn't, we haven't gotten into all the details, but the big snapshot picture of what it's about. My goal is that you guys will be coming for all of these extra classes, Sunday mornings, Sunday nights, Wednesday nights. I know it's difficult, but we are going to be working through these chapters. We're going to be working through all of this, and it's going to be more challenging if you're not here. You're trying to fill in and say, well, what did we cover last time? I didn't get that. So please, I pray that you'll make it a priority to come, and it will be a blessing to your life as we study this last book of the Bible. You know, we talked about this new kingdom, this, this, this army of Jesus, and it's not through power, it's through faith in Him. And like we said, if you have not died to your old self, if you have not been baptized into Christ, if you're not ready to follow Him, then why? Why not? Do we trust Him? Because... That day is coming. One way or another, that day is coming. We want to be on His team. We want to be right with Him. Or have we become like the church at Ephesus where I have been made right with Christ, but my love for Him has grown cold. You know, I, I, I've, I've kind of forgotten my first love. I've, I've gotten kind of away from what's most important. And if I need to make those things right, let's do it today. We have a song ready. And if you need to come at this moment, We'll be ready to pray with you and help you in any way we can.